we have this is um, we have Rebecca Baylog with us today. She's a land steward volunteer who's backing me up if something goes sideways with my technology. She'll just she'll take over and be the MC for us this evening. Uh, but hopefully things will be just fine. As I mentioned, this is brought to us by our program tonight is brought by the Land Steward um, Community Education Series. This is a group of volunteer land stewards who've been through the program and reach out. We reach out for ideas, things people want to learn, things people things people might want to teach. If you want to hear about our upcoming um, classes, you can just Google OSU Land Steward Program and click the subscribe button that's right on the home page there. Or you can, I'll put my email in the list too. Um, if, you, if you sign up for our subscribe button there, then you'll get, um, the only thing that comes over that is upcoming classes, events like this. So there's no spam that comes over that email if you're interested. So things like these, we have, it's, I can tell summer's coming because there are a lot of classes coming up. So this is a list if you go to our SOREC page and you see the events that are coming up. This is trail building that we have tonight and some other partners are have other things coming up. We have another one, Weed Control for Landowners on March 19th. Um, our uh, Chris Adlam is putting together some prescribed burning classes. You can become a certified bird man manager. I really want to highlight that. Ignite prescribed fire skills. And then we have another landscaping for water conservation classes coming up. And below these, there are a lot more events. Really, there are so many classes if you're interested in learning things. It's, extension is a great thing to be connected with. Um, but uh, talking about that landscaping for water conservation, this is part of a brand new sustainable living series that we are putting together. So for quite a while with the Land Steward Program, we, we um, our training and our classes have been kind of aimed towards folks that are living on rural land and kind of taking care of rural land, but lots of rural topics of rural interest. And we have really thought about, kind of brainstormed about how to do something like an urban land stewards that would be just for anyone. You don't have to own property. You can be a renter. You can live in town. What are the topics we need to know? So we're partnering now with um, our Master Gardener program in Jackson County and with the Jackson Soil and Water Conservation District, which are also just a group of great people with lots to offer. And we've put together this series called the Sustainable Living Series. Um, so the idea is they'll be branded with this banner and this sunflower and you can collect them all and we will have always a couple of kind of call to action at the end, things that you can do um, and be a path maker for a better future for all of us. And we'll have a QR code to a kind of, you can build your, your own little action item list. One of the things we love about the Landsteward program is that people get to make a plan. And that's often a really great way to kind of motivate oneself. So we're kind of incorporating that. So watch for those sustainable living opportunities. So that brings us to this evening's class, which is, um, trail building and now part part of it is blocked on my screen so I can't give you the whole title but I want to tell you about John Price. Uh, he is a wonderful land steward who we learned is has a lot of experience with trail building and he offered to give this class for us. So he's been involved in building, designing and maintaining trails for 25 years with the Ashland Woodland and Trails Association and the Pacific Crest Trail Association. He has attended PCTA Trail Skills College and has certifications in chainsaw and crosscut saw use. John frequently leads um, trail building maintenance projects and teaches trail skills to volunteers. He's an avid backpacker, trail runner, cyclist, gardener, and gardener. He enjoys getting sweaty and dirt covered. And with that, I will stop my share and John will uh, share his screen with you all. Okay, let's see if we can get what we want here. All right. Okay, thanks for that uh, nice uh, introduction, Rachel. Um, the title of this course is Trail Building, the Basics of Siding, Design, and Construction. When I got asked to do this, I um, decided to kind of orient this class toward the land steward community with the idea that you might be interested in possibly building a trail on your property. So I'm gonna spend some time uh, talking about how we go about siding trails, um, we'll talk how we design trails in different situations, and then we'll really get down into the nuts and bolts of how we actually construct a trail, the tools we use, and a few other uh, things. 
This is a picture of one of my favorite trails in the Ashton watershed. It's the Lewis Loops Trail. Uh, it's a trail we built about five years ago. It has beautiful views of Mount Ashland and great wildflowers. This is sort of the who am I and what the heck do I know page. Um, Rachel kind of went through that, but I'm like most volunteers. I just started as a trail user. I was a hiker and a backpacker who did some trail running, and I, I wanted to start giving back to the trails that I love. So I started volunteering with the Pacific Crest Trail Association uh, 25, 30 years ago. And then shortly after that, joined Ashland Woodlands and Trails Association and got to spend a lot of time in the dirt building, helping design and lead trail work projects. Um, one of the things that I learned is that most of the trails that we have are not maintained by professional trail crews. They're maintained by volunteers like you and me. And the Pacific Crest Trail, which is 2,600 miles long, it stretches from Mexico to Canada, is almost entirely maintained by volunteers, except for a few short sections through national parks. So um, volunteering is a big part of uh, doing trail work. Okay. So I want to spend some time today talking about how we go about uh, creating a good trail and what the characteristics of a good trail are. Um, I was going to definitely spend some time talking about how we prevent the bad from happening. And you see this more often than, than you would think. And finally, um, we're going to spend some time uh, helping you hopefully avoid creating the truly ugly. And most of these disasters are usually related to poor trail siding. Okay. So I got to thinking, if you're going to build a trail on your property, one of the things that you should probably do is there's a few questions that you should ask yourself before you start and hopefully uh, have the answer for. Obviously, you are going to want to know where you want your trail to go. You're going to want to know who and what is going to be using the trail. You're going to know what the hazards and challenges of your site are going to be. And finally, um, why do I want the trail and how big is the project? So let's get into each of those a little bit more. Where do I want the trail to go? Well, do you have a desired endpoint, a scenic spot, maybe a nice rock where you'd like it to go? Maybe you're building it to grandma's house. Um, you also may want to ask yourself, am I going to build a loop or is it going to be an outback trail? Now, so are there points along the way to your endpoint that are appealing, such as nice viewpoints or sit spots, rocks, et cetera. And the last uh, point that's important is in getting to your endpoint, are there desirable areas for trail building, such as uh, old roadbeds or skid roads that will make trail uh, building easier and less disturbing to the environment? Um, we do this all the time in the Ash Ashland watershed. You know, when we get out and start uh, you know, previewing an area and uh, bushwhacking an area and seeing what's out there, if we can find an old roadbed or skid road, uh, we'll use it because it makes our job way easier. And given that Southern Oregon is chuck a block full of old logging roads and skid roads, if you have some of these on your property, take advantage of them if you can. The who and what is almost as important as. Um, uh, the where, uh, because users play a huge role in how you design a trail. You're going to design a trail very differently if it's for hikers only versus, say, mountain bikes or horses or ATV and motorized use. You can take, you know, look at, at a situation like this. This is a trail that might just be a pedestrian trail with uh, an animal on it. That's going to be the simplest trail to build. But if you're building a trail for downhill mountain bikes, you're going to have to spend a ton of time thinking about how you're building corners, more width, and there's just a lot more things to think about. And certainly if you've got horses, you're going to have to build wider trails and really deal with erosion. So who use, is using the trail is really important, and it's something that you're going to want to keep in mind uh, before you start building. This was uh, one of my favorite trails in the Redwoods, and we ran into a Roosevelt uh, elk that day. So what are the hazards and challenges that my site presents? If you've got a really steep terrain, you may want to ask yourself, how steep can I build from my intended use? Will I need to build switchbacks? Uh, do I have ravines to cross? And can I get across those ravines? 
Water is always huge. Uh, you may have seasonal cricks to cross or even full blown cricks. Uh, do you have wet areas or drainage problems? Those are areas that you may want to avoid. What about trees that are down that may need bucking or heavy brush? And certainly if you've got gigantic patches of poison oak, that may be an area that you don't want to build a trail in. And this last one often doesn't get talked about, but it should be. And if you've got sensitive plant and tree areas or wildlife life habitat concerns, those may be areas that you want to avoid so you aren't uh, disturbing them. So this is an important point. Get to know your property really well before you start. And this is true of so many things. The, the better uh, or the more you know about what's out there, the better the job you'll do in designing your trail. We've run into this a, a few times uh, with AWTA where we've had a rare and endangered plant. I think it was Henderson, Henderson's Orchelia, and we've actually worked with a botanist to help route our trail in an area that didn't trample the Orchelia. So these are things that happen sometimes, and you may want to just keep in mind. And honestly, the same thing goes with uh, wildlife habitat. So think about those things. You should always know your why. Um, if your why is that you want a trail for solitude or just to spend some time out in nature, then your trail may be quite minimalist and very light on the land. You know, conversely, if your why involves heavier uses, um, you're going to have to engineer and build differently. And also, you may want to build a trail that challenges you a little bit. And in that case, you may be building uh, more steeper than you normally would. And the last question is, how big is the project? And you may want to ask yourself, can I realistically do this myself? Or am I going to have to enlist all my neighbors to help me or hire a trail crew or maybe use heavily, heavy equipment? A lot of people don't you know, really have any idea whether they can do it themselves or not. And if you don't, what I would uh, recommend is go out and volunteer for a day. Spend a half a day with one of our great local trail groups volunteering. And you'll very quickly, I think, get an idea whether this is something that you enjoy doing. <clears throat> I often find that we either get people who absolutely love trail building or we never see them again. And that's fine. But sometimes uh, it's a good way to find out whether or not this is for you. And I will, at the end of this, list uh, five local trail groups that I know of that I'm sure would be happy to have volunteers. Okay, let's start getting into design and location. Um, the photo on the right is uh, the Pacific Crest Trail going through the Goat Rocks Wilderness in Washington. I think that might be the neatest section of the PCT on the entire West Coast. If you ever get a chance to get into the Goat Rocks and see that trail, I would highly recommend it. It's amazing. I can't believe they put a trail there, but uh, um, they did, and it's a beautiful trail. Okay. So this is a little artsy statement about trails uh, building. Good trails have flow. They lay, lie lightly on the land and look like they just happened. And that's kind of a feely statement, but there is something to that. I think when you're on a good trail, you kind of know it. It flows well for whatever uh, you're using it for, whether you're hiking, running, biking, riding a horse, you know, whatever, whatever it is you're doing. So once you know where your endpoint is and where you want to have your trail go, you want to identify control points. And all control points are, are there places where you want your trail to go or not go. So positive control points might be a scenic spot, maybe a nice rock, desired destination, or maybe an easy place to cross water. It's funny, I ran into this today. I was on the Wonder Trail, which is a trail we recently built. And I went by this huge rock that's about 50 feet tall and covered in moss. It's this beautiful rock. And I I started laughing when I went by it because I re remembered uh, when we were scouting this area, we saw this huge rock and we went, you know, we've got to have the trail go by here. This is just amazing. And so we did. And um, in using the trail today, I was really happy that we did that. That was a really great uh, control point that we used. <clears throat> control points can also be negative, though, and that might include areas that are chronically wet, uh, poor or unstable soils, sensitive botanical areas, or wildlife habitat. 
Um, you know, one thing you may want to do if you're new to your property is see what's going on out there in the spring and summer. If you've got areas that are really, really rich in uh, wildflowers and have great soil, you may not want to put your trail right down through the middle of that. And the same thing goes through uh, for wildlife habitat. So again, get to know your property uh, before you start. You'll do a better job of trail siting. Okay, these are the tools that we uh, use for trail siting. Uh, the first one we use is called a clinometer, and it's a tool that we use for determining how steep a grade is. And a clinometer just looks like this. It's a little handheld tool that you look through, and typically you'll sight off a friend who's out there with you, and it allows you to determine how steep your trail is. I kind of think of the clinometer as a tool that keeps us honest. Um, we'll often be building a trail and we'll think, gee whiz, this looks great. It's not too steep. And we'll get the trail a clinometer out thinking that it, the trail is only 10% and it'll be 30%, which is too steep for us most of the time. So a uh, clinometer can be a super useful tool for uh, keeping your trail at the grade you want it to be. And you can also find out how steep the slope is that you're working on with this tool. The other tool uh, that we use all the time, and I consider this mandatory, are pin flags and ribbon. Um, pin flag is just a, a little pink plastic flag that's on a steel rod. You buy them by the hundred at a hardware store. Obviously, you see them in, at construction sites and things, but we use these uh, in trail locating um, all the time. And I love pin flags uh, because they allow you to see your trail uh, before you've done any digging or any work on your trail. And when we pin flag a trail, we'll go out with two or three of us and we'll start laying out our flags and gradually get our route flagged out and then we'll leave it. And we'll come back maybe a week later and we'll take a look at it again. And undoubtedly, the second time, we'll see two or three things that we don't like, and we'll move our flags. And we'll go through this process three or four times on a longer trail until we feel like we've got it right. And another thing we'll do is we'll make sure we walk it in both directions, both uphill and downhill, because you'll often see things that you don't see when you're walking uh, in opposite directions. But pin flagging allows you to get a feel for the, flight, the flow of your trail, what it looks like. And if you spend some time uh, kind of observing your pin flags and remarking them, you'll have a much better chance of getting your trail right uh, the first time. So those are pin flags. And we also use ribbons. If you're in an area where you can't see your pin flags well, you can use ribbons to mark trees and limbs and things like that. We always pick a really gaudy color for pin flags like neon pink or neon orange. Just pink, uh, pick something that you can see really well. The final tool we use a lot uh, is GPS. Uh, this allows you to visualize your uh, route on a map. And um, right over here is a, a GPS of an actual trail that we're proposing. Uh, you can see in a red, some existing trails. There's the toothpick trail and the catwalk trail that takes off above it. We've got a trail in yellow, um, that's a proposed trail. This is a trail that we've already pin flagged but the cool thing with GPS is this allows you to see your trail. And if you're making a presentation to a land use agency like your for like the Forest Service, they can see exactly what you're proposing. And you may also note on the right side of the map, um, there's a private private property boundary. And that's really important because this allows us to see that our trail hasn't uh, gone out of bounds uh, where we can't uh, cite the trail. And you may find on your own property that this is useful. If you're really not sure where your property line is, uh, but you can transfer this to a digital map, this may keep you out of trouble with your trail location. So that's GPS. I don't want to go into the weeds too much on how you do it. There is apps you can use on your phone and watches to make this happen. But honestly, it's an entire course probably to really get into the deeps on GPS. But at any rate, it's a really useful uh, tool, and I would encourage you to use it if you've got a big trail. And while I'm on it, I should say a few thoughts about trails on public land, in case you're thinking about doing that. Um, understand the approval process of the land agency that you're working with. 
Um, working with the Forest Service will be very different than working with a municipality. You may have a lot of prep work to do to propose a trail. And don't expect the approval process to be a quick one, and it may be expensive. So temper your expectations. Um, in our experience with uh, the Ashland uh, Watershed Trails plan, when we figured out what the process was with the Forest Service, we ended up spending almost a year and a half uh, prepping our plan. We had to GPS all the trails that were out there, all the illegal trails, and then we had to GPS our proposed trails. And we also had public meetings, and there was just a huge amount of work. And once we got our ducks in a row and our trail went in, our plan went into the trail uh, forest service, nothing happened. And so we had to uh, raise an enormous amount of money to pay for a NEPA study and eventually hire a consultant to help us get the plan moving. And four years later, we were done. And um, so the lesson from that is to be patient and hopefully you have a leader in your organization who's very, very stubborn. We had one uh, who was great, who did a fantastic job of keeping us on point. But my warning here would uh, be prepared to be patient because your little trail that's so important to you may not be at the top of the priority list for some poor Forest Service employee who's got 5,000 other things to worry about. One other thing that I should say is don't be tempted to build a rogue trail. Um, it is illegal, and it may come back to haunt you at some point. And also, there are a lot of good reasons why some areas don't have trails that you're not even thinking about. Okay, that's enough about public lands. I could probably talk about this for an hour and really get into the weeds on this, but that's that's a topic for another day. Okay. There are two um, technical uh, concepts that I should probably get out of the way before we get into it. One of it is percent grade. Uh, grade can be expressed as either a percent or an angle. And when we're talking grade, we're talking steepness. We use percent because it's easier to understand. Don't confuse percent with degrees. Um, percent grade just equals rise divided by run. So if you have a vertical rise of 10 feet over a horizontal run of 100 feet, you've got a 10% grade. 100% slope, which would be one foot of a rise to one foot of run, is actually a 45 degree slope. So actually, percent and degrees are very different, but we often mix them up. It's just good to stay consistent. The other thing I want to talk about is angle of repose. This is a really important material uh, materials concept. When I say angle of repose, I bet a lot of you were probably thinking about this great book by Wallace Stegner. I think he uses this angle of repose as a metaphor, but um, in trail building, um, the angle of repose is the steepest angle at which a sloping surface of loose material is stable. It will vary with different substances. And it's an important concept because it has a lot to do with erosion. When we're building the area, the uphill side of your trail, or what we call the upslope, if you have a very gentle upslope where the slope angle is less than the angle of repose, you won't tend to get a lot of erosion happening. If, however, you build a very steep slope above your trail, greater than the angle of repose, you're going to get erosion and mass wasting happening, and that's bad news. So this is an important concept when you're building the upslope above your trail, always try to make the slope gentle if you can. You'll get much less erosion happening. Okay, that's the end of the technical stuff. I'll try to get down to the more um, basic trail building stuff now. Okay, so we just talked about percent grade. Let's talk about uh, steepness a little bit. Steepness will determine how difficult your trail is going to be uh, to build. You know, the steeper it is, the more soil extraction you're going to have to do, and the more maintenance you'll need to do on steeper trails and hillsides. Ideally, most high-use trails should be in the 5 to 10% range. Uh, although you can build trails steeper than 20%, they're just going to be more difficult to maintain. And with that said, exceptions do exist. A scramble trail might be 50% or greater, but it's probably going to be on rock. 
This is a, an insane trail up in the Dolomites. It's probably 50 or 60%, but obviously people are using it and it's it's on rock, so it's it's holding up. So if you are building up a slope, how do we do it? You know, basically, um, the first thing I'm going to say is you don't want to build a trail that goes straight up uh, a fall line. We call that a fall line trail. And the reason you don't do that is if you go straight up a hill, your trail will become a creek when it rains and it's gonna be really steep. So we get up a, a hill in two ways. We either use uh, climbing turns like these right here, or we start to build switchbacks. We can build climbing turns in gentle terrain, usually under 15%. And when you're building a climbing turn, you're just maintaining your grade all the way through the turn. So if you're climbing at 5%, you keep that 5% grade all the way through your turn. It's really easy to build, but really only possible on gentler slopes. In Ashland, almost everything we got is like 50, 60, 80%. So we're always building switchbacks. And switchbacks are used on steeper terrain. They typically have a rel relatively flat and level constructed landing. So you're gonna spend a lot of time in a switchback uh, constructing a nice landing. And this is how we get up uh, steep slopes. I should also say something about steps. Occasionally you'll have uh, short areas that appear to be a nightmare to build a trail. And you may wanna think about possibly building a few steps. Sometimes that can help you get through a short area that would be difficult to build a trail um, otherwise. We don't particularly love steps, but sometimes they can get us out of a jam. And this is just a, a picture of a switchback. This is an important area of the landing. Switchback turns are harder to build than climbing turns, but they keep tread stable on steeper terrain. Most switchbacks are constructed to a much lower standard than is needed. The key to successful switchback construction is adequate excavation. And all that is gonna happen here in your corner and your landing. We have some corners we've built in the watershed where we've had to do a lot of excavation to be able to get a turn that, for example, an uphill mountain bike can make or even a hiker can make. So this is the area where you want to spend some time on when you're uh, building a, a switchback. And this is a really um, important slide from a design standpoint. Um, with respect to switchbacks, it's almost always better having longer runs uh, than short ones between your switchbacks. So in this picture here, you see two different trails that are going up the same hill. This bottom trail uh, goes up the hill with long runs and three switchbacks. The top trail goes up the same hill with 12 switchbacks and really short runs. Whenever you can, you always want your trail to look like what you see on the bottom. It's gonna be much easier to maintain. Uh, it's gonna look better uh, on the environment. Uh, people aren't gonna be inclined to cut and sheet your switchbacks, which is gonna cause erosion and it's gonna be a whole lot easier to build. Now, I suspect some of you are thinking, you're looking that up, that picture up top and thinking, you know, that GPS picture you showed us a while back looked like the one up top. And the reality is sometimes you may have to build like the picture you see up top because you have a really narrow, steep uh, slope to work on, on and just not a lot of room to work with. So there are situations where sometimes this is what you have to do. But if you have a choice, this is always kind of where you want to stay uh, with your design. So keep that in mind when you're designing. You'll make your life a lot easier if you build your trail like the trail on the bottom. And I should say something about flat terrain, since I've been talking about hills and all that. In general, avoid building on flat terrain as water has nowhere to go. And this is kind of the irony of this. Flat terrain is super easy to build a trail on. You know, it may involve just using a rake to scrape off an area where you can see the trail and you're kind of done. But the problem is always when it rains. A lot of times water doesn't have uh, anywhere to go and you've just got a muddy mess. Um, if you do have to build a trail on flat terrain, avoid areas where water collects, and it may be very useful to see what your site looks like after a rain event. This may clue you in as, as to which areas may get particularly boggy. 
Uh, chronic wet spots may require building up your trail above the water level. And you can use, uh, you might use bark or gravel, or maybe really get into building a turnpike or a puncheon, which I'll talk about a little later uh, in the presentation. Okay, tools, finally. Um, everybody asks me when they learn that I'm involved with trail building, what should I use to build a, uh, my trail with? And I can never really answer them because as always, Everything always comes back to geology. I don't care what you're talking about. It seems like it's always geology, but geology and soils will largely determine which tools are going to be useful for you. So here's three examples. Um, the trail on the, on the left is all rocks. That is the Telescope Peak Trail above Death Valley. It's an amazing trail, but it's literally all rocks. So I'm going to go back. If I'm working on a trail like that, I'm probably using a rock bar, a pick, and maybe a steel rake. Those might be my best friends. Conversely, if I'm working in classic Ashland decomposed granite, I'm going to use very, very different tools. And if in a, I'm in a thoughts and prayers situation, like you see down here on the bottom, I may use something else entirely different there. So let's get into tools a little bit. These are probably our three favorite uh, tools in the Ashton watershed. And in the watershed, we have decomposed granite, which is kind of the, it's kind of the holy grail of trail materials. It's really great. DG, uh, when it's wet, shapes really well. It cuts really well. In wintertime, when it's wet, it gets nice and grippy. It's really a great uh, trail building material. So we're really lucky to have that. But these are the tools that work well for us in that medium. Uh, the first one is the rogue hoe. Um, this is kind of a modified version of a McLeod, which many of you may be familiar with, uh, but it's also a dual tool. And we like to use tools that do more than one thing because quite often we have to carry our tools a long way to get to the work site. Uh, the Rogue Hoe has a rake end and it has a uh, hoeing end. And it also has a nice flat end that you can use for tamping in the outside edge of your trail. So it actually does three things. Interesting, uh, the Rogue isn't built in the Rogue Valley. It's actually made by a company in the Ozarks. Um, they make these tools out of old agricultural blades, but it's really good metal, and they make all kinds of tools for everything from gardening to uh, trail building. So you may want to check them out. I think it's rogueho.com. Um, the other tool we use all the time is the Pulaski. That's a classic firefighting tool. And it's another um, dual tool. It's uh, got a digging end on one side of it and a chopping end. And we like that because it's great for digging, but sometimes we have to we run into roots and things that we have to chop through and maybe brush that we have to get through. It's also light and fairly easy tool to carry. And our final tool that we do all our shaping with is just the plain old score-ended shovel. Um, sometimes your trail tools don't have to be fancy things. They can be stuff that you've got back in the woodshed. Uh, we use score-ended shovels all the time. These are a couple more tools that we use very frequently. The McLeod, I'm sure a lot of you are probably familiar with. It's a classic wildland firefighter uh, tool. They use this for making fire uh, lines really quickly. Uh, we use this to scrape organic debris off the trail. We probably use the rogue hoe a little bit more often. It seems to work a little bit better in our soils, but we still use this trail because it's so great at removing debris. And certainly when we've got a ton of digging to do, we sure uh, will bring out the pickmatic. Uh, most of you are familiar with this tool, and this is a tool that we'll use frequently if we've, if we've got a lot of digging uh, to do. And finally, um, I threw in the hazel hoe. This is kind of an old school tool. And actually, we don't use this much anymore. Uh, I see it in almost every trail cache. And I think it's been replaced by some of our dual tools that do the same thing and um, a lot more. Um, rock bars. Yeah, we use rock bars um, all the time. They allow you to create a fulcrum and you can mo move some really large rocks and boulders with these. And that's a super useful tool. When we're getting into brush, um, certainly chainsaws uh, can be mandatory at times. We use both electric and gas. And that little tool on top is a really cool, handy uh, trail tool. That's the Silky Katana Boy Handsaw. 
Uh, it's a tool that's really gotten popular in the trail building uh, community, community. It's a folding handsaw that has a blade that's about two feet long. And it's nice because you can just toss this in your backpack and you can literally cut through limbs and small trees that are 10 or 12 inches thick. And a lot of people will use this when they're trail scouting and doing work, but it's a nifty little tool that's a lot easier to huck around than a chainsaw is. And um, we love it. Uh, so that's another uh, super uh, useful tool to use. And finally, um, I should say something about vintage crosscut saws. It's kind of funny that um, these are still getting used, but these are getting really popular again. And they're popular uh, primarily for two reasons. Um, we use these things during fire season when um, we're not allowed to use chainsaws. So these cross cuts can be super, super uh, useful. It's, our, it's something about where we are. Oops, I think we've got somebody else on there, but it's all right. Uh, we also we use this video. Sorry about that. Um, we also use this uh, in wilderness areas. This is our tool of choice when we're working in the wilderness. So um, cross cut saws get used a lot. And there's a little bit of weird sound with this, but when you see pe two people working on this, it's amazing what you can cut through with one of these old um, saws. Um, if you happen to have one of these old saws hanging in an old barn or maybe in an old shed outside, please don't throw it away or turn it into an art project. Um, trail groups would love to have your uh, bucking cross cut. The bucking cross cut is a little thicker in the middle and it's stiffer. But these old saws are made from really good steel, and the design is much better than any new saw that you can find. And there's a real demand for these. So if you happen to have one of these, donate uh, this to a trail group or sell it on eBay. You'll find someone who uh, wants it. Um, and they're really fun to use. Um, you can get trained in using these. I think they're really, really fun. Things happen a little slower. They're quieter than a chainsaw. Um, there's something kind of romantic about using these old saws that I, I think is just really uh, kind of cool. Okay. Okay, getting into the guts of trail design. Uh, this is probably the one slide that you may want to commit to memory. Um, this is ideally, ideally what you want your trail to look like on a hillside. The trail tread is where you're going to walk or ride your bike or horse or whatever it is. Your trail tread ideally should be 18 to 24 inches wide and have a very slight outslope of about zero to 5%. We want that outslope so rain will sheet off your trail. One of the things that you never want to do is inslope your trail. If you do that, um, you're going to create a creek and your trail is going to get washed away. So that's an important design concept to remember. Also, your back slope the area above your trail, make sure you cut this at as gentle angle as you can. Remember the angle of repose. If you pay attention to that, you'll get a lot less erosion on your trail. I see some trails where you just cut it in, left a vertical wall behind, and you're going to get that just plopping down on the ground and being a mess in a year or two. So always try to cut a nice gentle uh, back slope to your trail. And then when you're finishing trail building, you're always going to really tamp down the weaker outside edge of your trail because that's the area that's going to tend to break down when you're building trail. So what are the characteristics of well-built trails? Well, they're relatively flat. They drain water well. They're going to be 18 to 30 inches in diameter and wider in corners, depending on the use. Your back slope and outslope there are going to be non-vertical or less erosive. Remember the angle of repose. And finally, you're going to want two to three feet of horizontal clearance from brush and six to 10 feet of vertical, vertical clearance. And the higher clearance is for equestrians. If you're sitting up higher on a horse, you're not going to want to have your head banging into a branch. Okay. This is a little uh, video that um, AWTA made that... Um, I want to show that we'll give you a little one minute primer, primer on how we build trails um, in the Ashland watershed. Okay, let's go back. Okay, so he's got a route that's been flagged here. 
And the first thing that he's going to do is he's going to remove organic matter. So he's got his rogue hoe or McLeod, and he's scraping the leaves and brush off the trail. Now he's going, getting busy with a Pulaski, and he's digging down to tread level with that tool. Once that's done, he's going to get that good old uh, square ended shovel and start digging in his initial trail tread. Now he's going to make it a little wider and maybe spend a little bit of time on the back slope. I would have liked to have seen him make this a little gentler in the back slope here. It's a little steep for my liking. And the last thing he's going to do is he's using a rogue hoe to tamp in the outside edge of his trail so it's a little firmer. And now checking the out slope and admiring his work. And that's basically, in a nutshell, um, how we build a trail um, in the Ashland watershed, and we'll run a trail crew. Uh, if you want to see this video again, I'll give you a link uh, to this for lots of videos like this, where you can get a real quick primer on uh, trail building like this. Okay, and this, this right here is sort of pictorially how we run a trail crew. If we have 15 or 20 volunteers out, We'll split into groups and typically our front group will be um, the people that are removing organic matter from the trail. So these folks are following our flagged pin line and they've got McLeods and rogue hoes and they're scraping the organic matter off the trail. And so this is what's happening right here. Then once they're done, the next group, our diggers are gonna move in and these folks are gonna be digging in with uh, Pulaski's rogue hose, shovels, and getting us down to tread level and kind of roughing in our trail. And then our last group of folks are going to be working with flat ended shovels and rogue hose, um, making our trail look really nice, finishing up, pounding in the outside edge and finishing it up. And that's the way we typically run a trail crew. Um, if you get a real good division of labor like this, you can build quite a bit of trail uh, fairly fast. The interesting thing is, you know, we have some days where we'll build a half mile trail and feel fantastic. And we'll have other days we'll feel fantastic after we built 60 yards of trail. And it's just because some areas are really hard to build trails in and some areas are really easy. So that's something to think about. Okay, I should definitely talk about dirt and water because water has a huge effect on whether you're gonna have a good trail or bad trail. This is a quote from sort of the Bible of trail building, the USDA Trail Construction and Maintenance Notebook. And it goes like this. Dirt, water, and gravity is what trail work is all about. The whole point of trail work is to get dirt where you want it and to keep it there. Water is the most powerful stuff in the world. Gravity is water's partner in crime. Their job is to take your precious dirt to the ocean. The whole point of trail work is to keep uh, your trail out of water's grip. And I couldn't agree more. Um, whenever you're building a trail, you should always think about what's water going to do? Because if you have water figured out, you probably um, accomplished the most, one of the most important things in uh, trail building. So how do we drain water? How do we handle water drainage? Well, the first thing we do is we make sure that our trail is outsloped. 5% is ideal. We build grade reversals into our trail. And this encourages water to sheet across and off your trail uh, rather than down it. And it also allows for smooth uh, transitions and requires very little maintenance. We can also build nicks, which are small areas that will drain puddles and corners. Finally, I should say something about water bars. Water bars used to be really popular, but they're really discouraged now. And the reason is they tend to fill up with sediment really quickly and they require uh, lots of maintenance. And it's not to say we don't use them anymore. I think they're still uh, particularly relevant in high alpine areas, but working down low, um, grade reversals are almost a uh, better, always a better way to go. And let's take a look at what a grade re reversal looks like. And here we go. This is um, actually the Red Queen Trail in Ashland. And if you look at this trail from left to right, it's basically going downhill, except right in the middle, there's a brief section where the trail goes uphill before resuming its downhill trend. And that is a grade reversal. And that's important because any water that might be going down your trail 
it's going to hit that grade reversal and stop and sheet off your trail. And that's why we like to build these. These don't require any maintenance once they're done, and they work great for keeping water off your trail. And the amazing thing is when you build these, you'd think you would notice these more often, but you just really uh, don't. And they work great for uh, handling water. And this is an example of a grade reversal on a new trail. And you can see the grade reversal right here. This is a trail that's kind of moving steeply downhill. But look at this area right here. There's a quick grade reversal and water will tend to sh uh, sheet off right in that area. Okay, here's a nick. And this is another technique for handling water. This is actually one of the most popular trails in the world. This is the tra uh, trail around Mont Blanc in Switzerland, I think. This trail is just worn in from use. It literally has tens of thousands of people hiking it every year. But what they've done is they built nicks into the trail. And that's just a little half moon nick into the bottom edge of the trail so that any water moving down the trail will hit the nick and off the trail it goes. And they'll have nicks every 30, 40 yards around the, along the trail. And it can work real uh, well in an area like this. Um, where you need to drain water off because your trail is just getting worn into a bit of a trough. So these are nicks, super useful and it's a simple technique um, to help drain water off your trail. And this just shows what you can do if you've got rocks. Um, this is actually a trail in the Dolomites where, or the Pyrenees, I think, where they have tons and tons of rocks and they actually use rocks here to construct a culvert. and it solved a really wet area. You can actually see a little water on the right side of your screen there, but it does show you uh, an, uh, an example of what you can do if you've got uh, lots of big rocks present and are fairly strong. Okay, let's get going the other way. Okay, we should talk about water crossing. And I think um, the question that comes up, do you really need a bridge? Um, and the only thing I really say there is, Finding simpler solutions using on-site materials is usually better and much more affordable. If you can get across a creek or a little seasonal water area with stepping stones, that's almost always better. There is a minimum tool philosophy in trail building, and it just kind of says, try to get the job done with the least amount of long-term impact. And with that said, there's some kind of cool things out there. This is actually a 400 meter long pedestrian bridge in Switzerland that crosses an avalanche chute. Um, it's amazing what you can do if you have the desire and I guess enough money uh, to do it. And here's some examples of, I'll call this simple water crossings, but simple is always relative with bridges. Uh, the picture on the left is in black and white is sort of a classic old time wilderness bridge. The crews have just uh, taken a couple of logs and they planed them on one side, set them into a sill, and voila, you've got a bridge. And that can work really well. The problem with those is these can get loose, so you have to spend some time maintaining these. But it can be a simple solution if you're just building a trail for yourself. Also, stepping stones, they can be tiny or they can be huge. Um, they seem to do a lot of these in Great Britain, where they just take these big rocks and create a water crossing. But it does show you that you can do some pretty crazy things with rocks. Um, I actually like using rocks because they stay put and um, don't require a lot of maintenance generally. And I threw this one in here because it's kind of a cool uh, bridge. This is in Mont uh, Robson Provisional Park in Canada. And this is actually a bridge that they take in and out of every year. This is an area of the floods in the spring when the water's running off the glacier. So I think they pick this thing up with a helicopter and haul it out. And then they put it back in every bridge, so every spring. So um, you can get creative with your water crossings if uh, you need to. Okay, so I brought this one up earlier. Um, what the heck do you do if you've got a muck fest like this? This was an actual trail um, that we hiked a few years ago outside of Jasper, Canada. That was a five-star trail that went to an amazing place. And it went on like this for about five miles. And obviously not my favorite trail in the world to hike on. And the entire time I was doing it, I was started thinking about what would I do differently here so it isn't such a mess. And the first thing that I would do is I would have 
cited it in a different place. I kept looking at this and I go, why did they put this down where it's flat here and water has nowhere to go? And I would have cited this probably higher up the hill in an area where the water is going to drain better. This is an also an area that gets used by uh, pack trains. So I think it would have been nice to separate um, user groups here maybe and have the hiking trail be built up in the woods and maybe keep the horses uh, down here. But you may have a section like this that's real short that you can't get around. So maybe you have to build a trail. So what do you do? Well, there's a lot of solutions to that. Sometimes uh, you'll see raised wooden trails made. Sometimes things like puncheons can be made. I think often the most common solution is a turnpike. Um, this is probably the most affordable solution. And if you want to see a turnpike, um, there's a great example of one or two actually on the south side of Mount Ashland on the Pacific Crest Trail. It's an area where people love to go hiking. It's really easy to access. There's fantastic wildflowers back there, butterflies, birding, you know, everything you can imagine. But it's also a really wet area and it's kind of a mess for building a trail. But what we did there was we built a turnpike. And basically what a turnpike does is it raises your trail tread up above where the water is. And turnpikes uh, can work. The, the problem with turnpikes is they take a lot of maintenance. Um, these uh, ditches will often get clogged, so you've got to get in and maintain them. The stakes that are holding your logs in will rot, and sometimes the rebar will work its way up. So if you are going to build something like this, you have to be uh, prepared to spend some time uh, maintaining it. And this is just a uh, picture of a turnpike. I don't want to go into the weeds too deeply on this, but basically what you're doing is you're laying a geotextile down over your muck. And then you're using some logs that are going to help retain your mineral soil and holding those logs in with uh, either stakes or rebar and then giving your water somewhere to go on each side of the trail. And that's kind of the idea behind building a turnpike. And like I say, it can be a solution, but just be prepared to do maintenance on it. Okay, that's turnpikes. Um, I will give you a resource that you can look at at the end if you're interested in making one of these and really going into the weeds on how to construct this. Okay, these are some common water problems. I showed this slide earlier, and this is again, another uh, a hugely popular trail. This is a trail around Mont Blanc. And the original trail was right here. And what happened? Well, it was built too steeply and they didn't do anything with the water on the trail. So every time it rains, uh, what happens is the water would just start running down the trail. Hey, I, hey John, Yeah. Um, you're kind of cutting out a little bit. I think maybe if you turn off your video, then it might help the bandwidth. Okay, let's do that. Or right. I mean, maybe that was just me. If somebody else could say, was John cutting out? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Let's try that. Okay. Are we still there, Rachel? Uh, yes, and Nolan said that uh, there was no cutting out. So maybe it was just me. So you can leave yours okay. on and I'll just uh, put mine down. So here we go. This started out as a trail right here. And as it got more and more eroded, it got deeper and deeper. And pretty soon nobody wants to hike on it anymore. So then they start hiking over here. So we have trail number two, and then they start hiking over here and we have trail number three. And we even have the start of trail number four over here. So this is classic braided trail. And this happened because one, the trail was built too steeply and water wasn't managed well. And this is an unfortunate situation because when it happens, it's going to be a major rehabilitation. This whole area is going to have to be flattened out. Um, they'll have to probably block it off with ropes and then re-vegetate uh, uh, the entire area. I probably would have uh, done a couple of switchbacks and maybe uh, built some uh, more uh, water clearance things in, but there would have been a fairly easy way to prevent this from happening. This is classic because this is a fall line trail. It's a trail that goes straight up a hill and it's raining, and it's become uh, a creek. And this is exactly what you don't want your trail to become. 
And this is why we don't build trails straight up a hill. Don't let your trail become a creek because eventually it's just gonna become a rutted out mess. And here down in this uh, mud pit, this is poor siting in an area where you just, uh, it doesn't drain well. So this is an example where you probably should have put your trail in a different place. Okay. Okay, I should talk a little bit about cribbing. Cribbing is something that we have to do a lot in the Ashland watershed because we're working on really uh, steep slopes. Trail cribbing is a way of using wood or rock on the downhill edge of your trail to retain trail tread. Um, it may be used to extend a trail out from an obstacle. Uh, it will be used to protect the edge of your trail and it helps to minimize erosion. So I wanna show a little short uh, video on how we do uh, cribbing. So this is an area where the outside edge of the trail where that person is walking is starting to break down and it's getting too narrow. And we've got to figure out what to do because it's really steep there. The outside edge is collapsing. And that's the finished product right there. Now, how did we get there? So the first thing that he's doing is he's got his rogue hoe out and he's getting organic debris out of the area. Now he's using a shovel to create a trough and what he's going to do is he's put a madrone log in there, which is present on site. And a madrone's nice because it doesn't uh, break down very quickly. And now he's filling in around that with decomposed granite and tamping it in really well. And now he's got some stakes, which he's cut from a drone, and he's going to drive those in and then cut them off. Hopefully not cut his hand off. Doesn't happen this fast in real life. And now some more dirt's going to go down and some more tamping, undoubtedly. And there you go. He's got um, a nice um, wide trail where before there was a very weak um, trail. And that's how you do uh, cribbing. But there are problems with cribbing. Cribbing has a limited lifespan. It will rot and burn. We've had a couple of situations where the uh, AFR people have gone in and done a prescribed burn in one of our trails and all of our cribbing has been burned out. So um, we've had to go back in and redo it. So if you're thinking about doing a prescribed burn on your uh, site, uh, do your cribbing after the burn. Uh, cribbing can also channel water. And if you're driving in with rebar, that can work its way out and stakes will rot. And as I mentioned before, uh, cribbing does require maintenance. And here's a few pictures. Um, this, is, this is ideally the way you wanna build up a weak outside edge of a trail. If you've got rocks present on site, build a rock retaining wall. Um, whenever we can do this, we love it because it's long-term sustainable. It's gonna hold up and you're gonna get a great result that's gonna last a long time. But sometimes you don't have rock present on site. So you may have to build cribbing like we've done here on the Wonder Trail. Or maybe you've got a corner that people are cutting and it's really eroding. So we've used cribbing in this corner to build up the cribbing. So those are some examples where cribbing uh, can be used to make your trail uh, last a little longer or even just make a trail possible. Okay. Roots and rocks, yeah, I should say something about this because this is something we run into all the time. Don't remove roots and rocks unless they're a hazard and certainly avoid cutting large roots. Uh, route your trails above large trees when possible and building below uh, trees can undermine your, uh, the root systems and damage the trees. So if you work, are working around a tree, try to stay above the tree whenever you can. Uh, cut stobs off below grade and also uh, use rock bars for large obstructions. And I actually love uh, this picture here. When we uh, flag this trail, you couldn't even see this rock. Um, and this is one of those things that can sometimes surprise you when you're starting to dig your trail out. Things are growing really, really great. And then all of a sudden you hit a rock like this and everything slows to a halt. And 
what we had to do here was dig out around this gigantic boulder to the point that we could possibly move it and then create a little area to roll it into. And then we used uh, rock bars to move it. So this is an example of uh, how you would uh, hopefully use your brains first and muscles last and um, use some rock bars to move a large obstruction out of the way uh, when you run into it on a trail. So the important thing here is use your head and save your back. Okay. I talked about stops. Um, we also call these no uh, Everybody who's been out on a trail, I'm sure you've probably tripped on one of these. I know I have. Um, so always cut stops off at grade level whenever you can. And finally, I should say a few things about trail maintenance because once you've built your trail, unfortunately, you're going to have to do some things to keep it in good shape. Obviously, the better design your trail is, the less work you're going to need to do later on. Uh, heavier uses will require more maintenance. And certainly, if you live in a wooded area, you will need to remove trees that will fall down and block your trail. And you may want to see what's happening during heavy rain events. That often will demonstrate where you've got problems. So this is our most common problem in the Ashland watershed. And um, it's not some weirdo that you run into on a trail. Trail creep happens when our trail begins to erode. And what happens is you'll start to have sloughing from the uphill side of the trail. And that sloughing will start to build up here. And as that happens, the area where people walk is going to start breaking down uh, on the outside of the trail. So. What happens with that over time is that nice trail that was once nice and flat is suddenly really canted. We put a uh, digital level on this trail, which at one time was a nice flat trail. Now it's 33%, way too steep. And this is a classic example of a uh, trail creek. And it will happen in areas that are a lot more prone to erosion. This um, right here is a classic um, area on the PCT where trail creep happens constantly. It's about eight miles west of Mount Ashland near Red Mountain. Uh, it's a steep area that's not very well vegetated and it's constantly eroding and we have to constantly kind of keep rebuilding that. It's amazing that uh, even though it gets thousands of trail users on it every year, it starts looking like hillside again fairly quickly. And I also am looking like at this, I'm actually realizing um, that this is probably a little isolated area of serpentine soil, which probably explains why we don't have a lot of vegetation on this slope. But this is a classic uh, case of trail creep and an area where you may have to do a lot of work to keep your trail staying a uh, trail. And this is something that happens if you've got trees on your property. Um, most of the year trees, when they come down, are probably going to be small and not particularly difficult. But every now and then, you may get some really large trees that fall or uproot, and that may be a challenge to remove some of those. We probably get 10 or 12 of these every year um, in the Ashland watershed, and they um, can be a challenge to remove. The one thing that I'm going to say about this is I think is um, simply this, just because you own a chainsaw doesn't mean that you should use a chainsaw. Um, bucking uh, big trees, particularly off trails, can be just as dangerous as tree falling. So make sure you really know what you're doing. Um, when I go out and do this with my saw partner, we're always wearing chaps and full protective gear, and we spend a lot of time having a saw plan and making sure uh, we know what we're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, uh, leave the saw at home and you know maybe talk to your neighbor who's a logger or find a friend you can do this. There's also opportunities to get education on, on how to uh, do this kind of work. Okay, I wanted to mention a few unusual scenarios that can come up. These are um, via ferrata. These are trails that you see in Europe all over the place for some reason we don't do much of these here. And I think this is just because we're too litigious as a society, but they do some pretty cool things. You'll see ladders going up steep areas. Sometimes they'll put steps into rock faces. You might even see a, 
you know, a, a steps going up to a golden Madonna somewhere. You see all kinds of nutty things, but it does show you that um, if you have a will to build a trail somewhere, you can often accomplish some pretty crazy uh, stuff. So anyway, something to think about and uh, something that's a little bit different. So I want to close uh, with this. And I think the important takeaway from this is uh, when you're building a trail, do it your own way and make, make sure that when you're out there that you have fun and get dirty. When you're building a trail, it doesn't have to be perfect. A trail is not a freeway. It's an imperfect thing by nature. And you can read through this uh, statement. It's, it's a perfect one uh, about the way I feel about trail building. But <clears throat> in the end, trail building uh, should be a chance to get out in the dirt and have fun. And hopefully you create something that you'll really enjoy. I love this old picture. Um, this, I think, is a classic old CCC trail crew from the 1930s. Uh, they probably got to spend an entire season out in the woods building trails and working on lodges. That must have been amazing, uh, an amazing time to do that kind of work. And this is my resource page. Um, if you would like to learn more, um, my organization is ashlandtrails.org. And if you go to the trail maintenance tab. You can get all kinds of videos and uh, trail building information. Um, the Pacific Crest Trails Association is a great resource. Uh, they put on a trail skills college um, all up and down the West Coast. They're typically two-day affairs, so they're not a major life commitment, um, but you can learn a lot about trail building. You can get uh, certifications and using chainsaws and crosscuts and things like that. So the PCTA is a great organization to get involved with. <clears throat> Locally, we have a Big Bend uh, Trail Skills College um, up at Hyatt Lake in uh, June, I think. Uh, so check that out at uh, the PCTA. And volunteer. Uh, we have a ton of really, really good uh, local trail uh, organizations. Um, there's the Pacific Crest Trail Association, which I mentioned. Um, there's my organization, AWTA, that works in the Ashland uh, watershed. The Siskiyou Mountain Club is a great organization that does a ton of work out in our wilderness areas around here. They'll go out for a day and sometimes out for a week. So that can be an opportunity to do a backpack trip and some trail work. Um, they get out into the Kamiopsis the Red Buttes, the Siskiyou Wilderness, and the Rogue Wilderness, um, and they do a lot of cross-cut saw work. They're a great uh, group. Uh, the Applegate uh, Trails Alliance and the Siskiyou Uplands Trails Alliance. All these groups are great trail groups doing a lot of good work. They have um, some great uh, opportunities to volunteer if you want to do that. And finally, uh, I mentioned the USDA Trail Construction and Maintenance Notebook. I think it's out of print, but if you simply Google this online, uh, it'll come up and you can read through this to your heart's content. It's kind of a fun little book that's easy to read with gobs and gobs of trail information. So uh, that's the end of my presentation and I'm just about out of gas, I think. So I will open the floor, Rachel, to questions and anything that anyone would like to ask me. Okay. John, you want to uh, stop your share? That was that was amazing. It reminded me of the movie Being There, where the gardener is giving all this advice. I think I have figured out my life after listening to your presentation about <laughs> I need uh, more control points and some re grade reversals. And <laughs> There's a lot to so, think about. Yeah, that was really, really good. <laughs> Terrific. Um, and there's um, some questions in the chat, but I think I think we'll let the folks who are willing to ask their questions in person here first, and then I'll read the questions in the chat. So uh, go ahead and maybe if folks who would like to speak with John, um, just one on one, go ahead and open your video. And then I think Mark requested first, he had a question. Sure, I can lead off. This is a little bit of a complicated question um, and not exactly on the discussion points you've already gone through. Um, I'm chairman of the Applegate Trails Association. Um, I'll tell you what I'm worried about, liability. A uh, couple, we've had on the drawing board a, a trail um, here in the in the Applegate uh, and for a couple of years. 
And uh, this last uh, last summer, the Douglas fir started really dying off in, in this particular area where we'd routed a trail through for about three quarters of a mile. We could route it to a different, you know, an oak woodland and not go through an area of, of dying Douglas fir. Actually, the Douglas fir is not dying in that particular area. To go down just a little bit in elevation, a couple hundred feet. And I've, if you, those of you who haven't been in this area uh, recently, uh, we've had, uh, we're having a lot of die off uh, of trees. <clears throat> so, so first, first blush on this would be, oh, don't worry about it, Trail Association. Uh, it's BLM is the landowner. They're going to be the target for any lawsuit if there's a, you know, somebody gets injured tree falls down on them and, and there's a lawsuit. Um, John, I'm sure you're familiar and, and know much more than I do about the recent lawsuit that uh, in Oregon, under Oregon law, if I remember this correctly, um, uh, it, it well, first off, there's a law in Oregon that if private landowners give an easement um, and for recreational use for hiking, and somebody gets hurt, they're not liable. Well, strange things happen. So this woman is walking to work. She's not hiking, out hiking. She's walking to work, bridge collapses, and she won her lawsuit. And the reaction to that was a, a lot of municipalities that have, including Ashland, um, have, have trail systems. We're thinking of closing them down. And I, I'm not current on the event there. But just that's just sort of background of, of, of what can happen. So when you're when you're a trail association like we are, it's a nonprofit, it's a corporation. Corporate law would apply to a lots of things, including the duties of the directors. So so the picture I would paint is okay, we had this trail routed through, it's not built yet, it's going through the environmental assessment process with BLM. Um, had this trail planned. And the trees start dying and we know about it and we continue with it, you know, in 10 years, 20 years from now, trees falls down, kills somebody, whatever. And there's a lawsuit in addition to suing BLM, they sue the Trail Association. And you may not be able to comment on this directly, but maybe you could point me in a direction to some resources that, that might help answer the question here about liability. Yeah, um, I knew the first question was going to be above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a great question, and it certainly is something that everybody's talking about. Um, there's some legislation that's going through uh, the state legislature right now, so this is kind of one of those stay tuned kind of things. I'm not going to answer this a lot because there's just way too many unknowns with this right now. You're certainly want to going to you're going to want to get uh, insurance for your board. I would assume that your board's insured. We are. Um, we're also uh, protected at least uh, by the city of Ashland. Um, we've had assurances from the city attorney uh, that we're protected from litigation, and the Forest Service has also told that uh, told us that. But there are some unknowns, uh, as you mentioned, with respect to that wa uh, lawsuit. So I think we're just going to have to kind of sit back and watch and see what happens. And, you know, I wish I could give you a clear answer on this, and I can't. I'm certainly not a lawyer. Um, I used to be a dentist when I worked. So this is way above my pay grade, the actual um, legal side of this. But it's something we're all going to have to think about and just see how it plays out. Thank you. OK, um, I will go ahead and read some of the questions from our chat. Bruce says, can you talk about making a trail for handicap access? Yeah, yeah. In fact, you know, we've talked about that um, for us in the Ashton watershed. And one of the huge problems we run into is because Ashland's right up against the Siskiyou Mountains is everything is just so steep. We've got to cut like crazy to even, you know, make a tra trail for uh, narrow use. But um, we're actually working on an area where we hope we can um, uh, get uh, handicapped access. You know, if you're building for handicapped access, you're going to have to build wider and you're going to have to really make sure you've got a, a very stable trail. It's going to be a challenge to build on really, really steep slopes. And one of the things that I've seen done that I don't like is I've seen a lot of parks that have uh, 
put in a trail for hiking and they pave it with a little, you know, two feet of asphalt. And three years later, it's just a bumpy mess with roots pushing it up and a disaster. And I've seen a ton of instances where these handicapped trails are poorly done. And I think the one comment I would make is, if you're going to do it, you've just got to do it right. And you've got to spend some time making sure that you've got a really nice, uh, stable trail to uh, use. And I personally, if I were doing that, I would bring a handicapped person in to consult with, to just ask them, what do you need? And what do you want out here? And I think you'd do a better job building your trail if you did that. Yeah, good point. More uh, being their advice. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, how do you choose a where to cite a switchback. It seems like you could create some sense of mystery of, of, of what's around the corner. Also, how do you prevent <laughs> people from cheating and going straight up and down the hill? Yeah, we talk about the cheating thing all the time. And we have these arguments, even, you know, even between three of us who've been, you know, marking trails all the time. I like really steep trails. My friends like shallower trails. And it's just it's just kind of funny. There's not necessarily a right answer to that. If on really gentle terrain, you you build too many switchbacks, you're going to know it because you're going to see people cheating all the time. Dogs will cut your switchbacks. Um, it's going to be a mess. A lot of it often comes down to how steep a grade you can build. You know, if you're stuck building at 10%, that's going to determine how tight your switchbacks are probably going to be and also how long the runs between your switchbacks are. We tend to choose an area for a switchback that looks like it might have an area that could be kind of a nice flat landing and maybe we've got some room to dig. But I also think there's a real art uh, to doing that. So, you know, I'm not giving you a perfect answer to that, but try to find an area where you've got some room to make a landing. And if you've got some rocks present there, even better. Sometimes we even use the uphill side of a tree um, because that can help stabilize the bottom edge of your trail. Okay, yeah, I, I did want to comment. Um, the way the Ashland Watershed trails have been redone and separating the users and some of those areas that I went back in after a lot of that work was done, I really understood when I saw your, your GPS use, how you laid those out. I've walked in there and I'm like, I don't even understand. Bikes are whizzing by in different places and you're walking. I, It was a mystery how you figured that all out. So Yeah, well one, of the, one of the big things that we we did, and I think this is being copied elsewhere, is we really wanted to separate user groups. Yeah. We didn't feel like, we, we didn't want to have people hiking up trails, running into downhill mountain bikes. Yeah. And certainly downhill mountain bikers don't want to run into people. So user group separation is, I think, a really great idea. And it's a great way to reduce conflict on trails. Yeah, I, I th well done. Well done. It was nerve wracking for a while. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't mountain bike much. So anyway, let's see here. Sound issues. Is there, a, is there a time where you would need a permit to build a trail? E, on your own property? Uh, no, I, I suppose if you were doing something involving a creek, you might get into some issues, but basically on your own property, not that I'm particularly aware of. But, you know, we do all of our building on public lands. So we've always got to get permission, whether it's uh, the Forest Service or the city of Ashland. There's a process that we have to go through in our permitting. It's relatively easier with the city and it's kind of a nightmare with the Forest Service. But um, yeah, there, there is a process um, that you definitely have to follow when you're doing that. Yeah, okay. So this is maybe kind of a, similar or a follow-up question. Oh no, someone says, what are the pros and cons of using existing deer trail? That's a good question. I yeah, you know, that's true. You know, sometimes you'll see a wildlife trail that may, just makes sense. I think, you know, deer and a lot of animals are smart about the route that they choose. And that, that may give you a hint that, hey, maybe that's a good place to build a trail. The only thing to keep in mind is deer are pretty good at going straight up a really tough hill. And you may find that deer trail is 40 or 50%, you know, but we do that sometimes, you know, sometimes wildlife trails are a good indicator that, hey, this is a good place for a trail. They know what they're doing. Right. Um, can you recommend ways to build trails with machines? Hand tools are nice, but many people are needed to, 
uh, for long trails? Yeah, um, we do all of our trail building with volunteers and hand tools. Um, our mountain bikers have uh, built some trails though with heavy machinery and uh, certainly with wider mountain bike trails where you're building corners, you know, using uh, uh, different types of heavy equipment can be super useful. Um, I don't really want to go into using heavy equipment because it's not really my area of specialty, but the basically if you got something that will allow you to uh, move dirt in front of your machine and construct a nice flat area um, is super useful. We do know there's actually a machine out there that is specifically designed for trail building. Um, hmm. AWTA uh, years ago was thinking about buying one when we thought we might be building a trail on Grizzly Peak. And one of the uh, issues over there is that it's not nice decomposed granite. It's really nasty oh, clay and right. rock. So right. having a trail building machine would have been great. So there is actually a machine that's used for doing that. I have no idea what the cost is, um, but that could be something to look at if you're doing some real serious trail building. Right. Okay. Um, let's see. Anybody who wants to copy the chat, if you find the ellipsis in the chat place there, you can click that and save it the chat as a text if you want to, if there's any information you want to capture. And also you mentioned those um, resources. So uh, I, you can send me those and I'll send those to folks with yeah. the link to the recording. Um, let's see here, lots of thanks and mentions about different trail organizations. Uh, question, John, thanks for the presentation. What is the trail that you built requiring contracted NEPA and why did the USFS not provide the NEPA assistance? <laughs> Actually, every single one of our trails on Forest Service land had to go through NEPA. Um, and part of it was uh, we were we were building in an area that's considered LSR, it's late successional reserve forest. And that creates some challenges uh, in creating a trail system. So um, we literally had to have every single trail that's on uh, Forest Service land go through NEPA. And I think we ended up raising, oh gosh, almost $50,000 through the Mount Ashton Hill Climb and the Siskiyou Outback Trail Run. Our little trail runs kind of huh. supported the funding wow. of this and made it possible. Huh. Um, but it can be a real process uh, to make this stuff happen. Huh. Interesting. Um... All right, Annette says, thanks, John. Excellent presentation. FYI, SUDA is Siskiyou Upland Trails Association rather than Alliance. <laughs> Thank Same you. as with ATA, I'm on SUDA board and really appreciate your presentation. The more people who understand this stuff, the better our volunteer work parties go. Well done, John. Thanks for your thoughtful presentation. Thanks. Lots of kudos there. Uh, Tricia says, on private land, what are constraints to building trails or even bridges in riparian zones? Yeah, that um, that can be a little tricky. You know, I I like to be cautious with trail building in riparian zones and not disturb them too much because you know usually it's a really botanically rich area. Um, as far as legalities, you know, sometimes you get into some weird things with seasonal cricks and that type of thing, and I'm not probably the right person to ask about that. But I think the only thing that I would say I feel kind of strongly about is try to use a pretty light hand if you're building a trail in a riparian area because they are special areas for wildlife and botany and we want to try to leave them alone if you can or if you've got a cross an area like that try to do it uh, uh, quickly and and make a, an easy light crossing where you're doing it. Nice. Yeah. Um, in the land steward training this year, our, the person from or Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife was talking about um, kind of migratory deer areas and house building. And he said that uh, the not, not, of course, our urban deer that are very used to people, but but the deer that are in the wildlands, that it's about a 300 foot disturbance area. So if you are going to go into areas where the wildlife are using for for whatever purpose, if you want to think about avoiding it, try to stay 300 feet away and that will not disturb them as much. They'll uh, be less 
perturbed by what the activity that's going on there. Like roads, for example, they said, you know, if you're going to build a house, build your house within 300 feet of a road because they're already going to be disturbed by that. Yeah. That's okay. a great point. Yeah. Alex says, uh, where can one get proper chainsaw training for large diameter trees that are on the ground crossing uh, want to be trailed? Oh, so much pinching. I'm yeah. Like there, uh, but, the, but the chainsaw training. Yeah. Um, Pacific Crest Trail Association. Go to their trail skills college. They um, do offer certification. That's great. In how to use chainsaw and cross cut saw. Uh, the Forest Service does too. I think um, when I got my initial training about 20 years ago, uh, we went up to Butte Falls and had these two yeah. good old boy loggers teaching us how to do it. But, you know, nice. we were greenhorns and we had no clue, but um, definitely getting some training is super useful. The Forest Service has a fantastic uh, trainer named uh, Angie uh, Painter, I think, who uh, does a great training. But um, yeah, get some training because uh, removing big logs is dangerous and you really want to know what you're doing um, before you do it. Nice. Thank you. I'm going to follow up with you about that. <laughs> um, excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. This was great information. Will John's slides be made available to participants? Well, the recording will be. Do you want to share your... Yeah, I'm happy to, uh, for sure. Everything is available and a lot of the stuff that I used is on AWTA's website or in that uh, USDA trail construction notebook. Okay. So Great. Okay, excellent presentation. Thanks. Um, let's see. When would you have opportunity next for volunteers in National Watershed? That was such good advice to volunteer to find out. Yeah, um, yeah. take a look at our website. Um, I do think we have a trail maintenance day coming up. We just had one, I think, a week ago. Uh, we have another one uh, coming up in, a, I think, a week. We're we're kind of in a holding pattern right now with uh, our last big trail. Um, the Forest Service, unfortunately, doesn't have a position uh, manned right now that is where we need an answer from. So we were hoping to be building a brand new trail this year, and it's going to be pushed to next year, it looks like. So we're doing trail uh, maintenance, but some of those other organizations will certainly be building new trails, so that may be an opportunity as well. Do you have a listserv or something that you send out information? Uh, we, If you get on our mailing list, you can go to our website and get on your mailing list, and we okay. will send out uh, information on all of our work parties and when they're happening. Uh, generally, they're happening starting in early November and running to May or in, yeah, till mid to late May. We don't uh, work on trails in the summer here because our trails get too dry and they turn to dust. So you can't do a lot of work. Okay. During that season, we'll tend to be working up high in the snow zone, maybe on the PCT or the Wagner Glade Trail uh, and up in the higher areas. Okay. Yep. That kind of gets to Rebecca's question. Are there better times of year to build a trail? I think you just yeah. answered. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and this will de depend on your soils. You know, if you've got really gnarly clay, you may want to wait till it, you know, is just a little easier to work. But ironically, in Ashland, our trails are really easy to work when it's wet and they're a nightmare in the summertime. Right. And it's different in different places. And there's some areas that you just can't get into because of the snow and you've got to get there when you can. Right. Okay. Nice. Well, this was really excellent, John. I want to leave you with um, a book called The Old Ways by Robert McFarlane. If you haven't read that, it's just full of kind of information about the idea of trails and paths awesome. and how it links with people and language and stuff. And that really was terrific. This was a really dense and informative talk. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. I hope I Wonderful. didn't sleep and uh, I'll be sure. I don't think so. <laughs> read that book. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, and thanks, Rebecca, for backing us up. I'll get the recording out to folks tomorrow. Have a good evening. Right. Thanks.